It's a container manager that is written in pure C. First, of course, uh, who am I? My nickname is Rick M.M., uh, as it be. Um, I have been involved with Linux uh, since the early 2000s. I, there was a time, also early 2000s, when I got close to the MIPS architecture. At some point, I think because I got obsessed with porting Linux on a bunch of uh, early handheld PCs. Um, this is before smartphones. Uh, these devices were quite cool. And they used to be MIPS early on, some of them SH, uh, before ARM came and took the whole pie. Uh, some of these MIPS and then later ARM work uh, led to a drive for understanding low-level OS concepts. I ended up becoming a Gentoo developer as well for a bunch of years, maintaining a bunch of MIPS hardware. I no longer do that. And then I worked at Canonical for five, six years, something like that, working not on the main distro, but actually on the device uh, strategies and device side of things from Canonical. For example, early day uh, testing of Ubuntu on mobiles and tablets which resulted in Ubuntu Touch, or Ubuntu on mobile, as it was called back then. Now it's called uh, Ubuntu Touch, thanks to the community effort that still maintains this, of which I'm also a part. And after that, I was part of the team that brought about Ubuntu Core. That was the end of my relationship with Canonical. Uh, after that, I, I left um, on the, the most part to found uh, what we are doing now. Um, I am one of the founders at, at Pantacore since 2016, so been working there for a bunch of years now. <laughs> and as a side note, I also sit on the on the board of the UV Ports Foundation, which advances uh, Ubuntu Touch with a pure community effort. Uh, now, a little disclaimer: this session is not a tech deep dive. We're not going to be running tutorials for you to follow up on your laptops, uh, but rather it's a conversation-provoking exercise. Uh, the idea here is to discuss the topics at hand, um, and of course, also at the end, uh, there will be a shameless blog. I will tell you a bit about the container management engine that I wrote for Embedded. Um, now, the, the important thing here is not what is written or, or you know, like what did I write. <laughs> it's actually more why was something written in the way that I did, and and why do I believe? Uh, why do we believe that? Um, a container management engine in pure C is very important to the modernization and the advancement of, of all the great work that this that this bunch of people here do, right? I mean, at the end of the day, what we do powers the infrastructure of the world, right? Powers everything that people use, all the gadgets, all the things that makes people's lives easier. It's thanks to embedded Linux. So. First and foremost, um, <laughs> whales are too big for embedded boards, right? Why do I say that? Well, it has been a huge push from the cloud, from cloud vendors, uh, cloud people, cloud developers, web developers, whatever you want to call it, um, about bringing the technologies that, that have made sense on the cloud and, and how to fit them one-to-one -one, um, in the world of embedded, right? Um, you know, this, this is kind of weird because, you know, there, there's a bunch of people that have, not a lot of experience, let's say, on what true embedded means, um, telling us how we should be using certain tools that have made sense for cloud, right? And that's why I have this image here, you know, with a, a, a managerial decision and an issue that happened at some point uh, meant that these people had to solve a weird problem of putting a square into a, into a hole, right? Um, over there it worked and they were able to bring their astronauts back, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should always follow that approach, right? A square peg into a round hole type of thing. So that's not to say that containers are not useful uh, for embedded. On the contrary, containers have modernized cloud computing and we think it can do the same for embedded. We're seeing it already, right? We know the, the, the usual benefits of containers, right? Uh, efficient resource utilization, modularization of software, portability, security, uh, practices like CI CD pipelines become straightforward when you have this type of modular software architectures. And you know, Docker containers and OCI containers and, and the like uh, have been perfect for the cloud where resources are near limitless. But how does that work uh, with most embedded Linux devices today? Um, let's see. Well, first the question is, how is the cloud different from, from embedded Linux devices? Um, this might sound like an obvious answer to you guys, right? 
But to a bunch of these people that are investing tens of millions of dollars in marketing budget to tell us, run Docker on your tiny device, uh, I think it's not obvious, right? So let's say it here. A data center has near infinite resources, right? A server is, you know, it, it, you won't lose power. It has infinite connectivity. It is resilient. It, it has a technician next to it if something happens to it, right? Um, and it's not truly mission critical, right? With the current type of cloud architecture, things are very ephemeral, right? Something dies somewhere, it will just spawn again somewhere else, right? Um, infinite replication means that, you know, if infrastructure fails somewhere, it's not a huge issue, right? It is an issue, don't get me wrong, but, but it's not a huge one. Um, now, tell that to your mother's router, right? Your Wi-Fi router in, in her home. If it goes down, that's it. No more Netflix, right? It has to call the, the technician at the ISP. That might involve a call. You might be without connectivity for 24 hours. That's mission critical in a user's home, right? I'm not even going to get started with robots in a factory. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you can, <laughs> you can think about that one yourselves. Uh, but, you know, for the common user, it's also mission critical, right? If your thermostat fails, well, that's bad, right? You freeze. Um, if your fridge fails, that's bad. Your food goes bad, right? So embedded is mission critical. Embedded requires extreme resilience, right? And usually the resources are extremely constrained. So, you know, this is basically what we're saying. We can agree that maybe your minimum specifications for an embedded Linux device look something like this in this current day and age, January 2022. Um, this evolves. Maybe last year I would have said 16 megabytes of NOR flash. Some people would be doing. Uh, but for example, we can see a bunch of routers nowadays are going to 128 megabytes of NAND storage. Um, some of them even have EMMC. But still, most embedded devices are in the lower range of this. A lot of them without a flash translation layer even. right? Um, our usual architectures, we know them, ARM, MIPS, RISC-V. Um, and virtually, of course, I say any Linux distribution, but in reality, what it means is whatever goes, right? Whatever you need to actually build your system. You want to build something on top of Yocto, open embedded or whatever, go for it, right? You want to use a, a Linaro reference build for some board, go for it, right? Um, or let's say if you want to make a router, most likely you're going to go the way of OpenWRT, right? So now going back to the topic, right? Why? Why do we think that with this type of resources or why do we think that containers are important for embedded, right? Well, if we do away with the problem of do these cloud tools fit, right? We remain behind with the benefits. We say, well, modern software this development and firmware lifecycle management at speed, right? Modernizing the way that we manage the software on an embedded device is important, right? We have been doing it the same way for the past 20 years, 20, 25 years plus, right? Um, maybe it's time to change, right? We're seeing, we're starting to see the same problems that the cloud was seeing uh, six, seven years ago, right? When servers and applications were just getting too huge, too complex to manage, right? So what does that mean, right? I mean, what, what do containers help us do over here, right? In, in, in the embedded world that is starting to see that problem. On the diagram on the left, you can see what I mean by that problem, right? The embedded firmware is becoming this huge monolith, monolithic image, right? That just incorporates all those features. The bigger and the, comp the more complex that gets, the longer your release cycles are. This prevents valuable and fast innovation, you know? A monolithic release is time consuming to produce, it's error prone, right? Um, and, you know, the, the two above points result in that some devices end up being very stale out there in the field, right? They're not updated. They can be very insecure and vulnerable to attack, right? This creates incredible surfaces of attack. Uh, we have seen it many times. You see some ISP in Germany a few couple years ago ended up having over a million routers compromised, creating a botnet that actually required, I think, a technician visit or sending the box back or something like that. Imagine the cost of that, right? Um, but, you know, that's, that's the sort of catastrophic scenario. But on the, on the normal, you know, day-to-day -day business, just those long release cycles that prevent innovation prevent you from adding new features fast enough, right? So we need to start doing what this diagram on the left is doing. We need to start sort of releasing the pressure of that monolith 
into a feature-rich pipeline. We need to start releasing so that it becomes modular applications that sit on top of a, of a smaller core, let's call it, right? Um, and to achieve this, well, the, the easiest way, of course, is with containers, right? Let's not try to reinvent the wheel, right? Let's just make sure that our wheel fits our use case, right? Um, however, that's, that's the main point here. Everybody is telling you, use Docker, use your, uh, OCI runtimes, um, base solutions, but but why? You know, embedded wasn't built. Uh, sorry, Docker wasn't built for embedded devices. Uh, most of these your OCI compliant runtimes out there wasn't built uh, with embedded in mind. Right. So we propose a different type of architecture right? that doesn't mean having a huge OS and then on top of that a container runtime and then on top of that container applications, but rather a different a shift in paradigm. We, we're true proponents of something that we like to call uh, the minimal container runtime, right? I think that, that the legacy, let's say, Docker type of, of architecture where you have your hardware, a host OS on top, a bloated host OS, then a Docker engine, and then on top of that, your business logic is just too much overhead, right? It's too much for the majority of low spec uh, embedded devices out there, right? In, you know, embedded, Nowadays, it's about more features, but it still is a well-defined, it still is about a well-defined feature set. The operator, the device manufacturer, they want to extend the features, but they want to be in control of those features, right? So do we even need a main OS, a big host OS sitting below all of everything we just mentioned as we know them in our true embedded use case, right? Is that necessary or do we just need to modularize the actual software functions that are sitting on this device, right? Um, and that's what we propose, right? I mean, we propose doing away with the concept of a host OS. Why should there be a host OS? Why don't we just have a very tiny container runtime that sets up one too many user lands running on top of it via containerization <coughs> uh, tooling and technologies of the kernel, right? Um, in, in the diagram on the right, you can see what I mean, right? Uh, there's one that says host, web, host OS, but in reality, this is just another application. It's just another user land that might start one too many services inside of a container that provides some functionality. For example, networking, whereas another one of these applications might provide power control, let's say for a, I don't know, a fridge or something like that. Um, now, there's a little text here that says hint in it user namespace, right? I have always said that this is an evolution of, 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 of a, or rather an extension of what the kernel does by default, right? On your left-hand model, that host OS is also running in a container for all intents and purposes. I mean, you can extrapolate a little bit from some concepts of the kernel, but your main OS always runs into something called the init user namespace. Oh, surprise, the kernel is actually running containers for everything. So what we're doing here is extending that concept and saying, okay, why don't we use that in the user namespace, that main namespace, just to provide a very minimal container runtime and then run all of the actual relevant software functions on top of it. This, this is interesting, right? Because this lets us do what? It lets us manage the entire life cycle of every software component on the device in a very straightforward manner, right? It lets us decouple the life cycle of all the higher level software that is running on that device and the firmware that is running below that high level software, but through a common protocol. Now, if we have a minimal container runtime, well, we have to decide what to write it on, right? Um, you know, and this is where it gets interesting. This is where you start talking about, or at least having the conversation as to, is it what the cloud vendors are telling us or is it something else, right? We think it's C, right? So, you know, a minimal container runtime, why C, right? Well, first and foremost, all of those cloud IoT proponents out there with their whole, you know, 3.7 seconds of experience with embedded have been employing a lot of web developers to solve the challenges of embedded. But these are web developers, right? And they have been telling us how embedded should be done. Okay, well, that you could, that's a bit of a brute force attempt, let's say, right? <laughs> but in reality, you know, um, we have heard, it is not uncommon for these people to tell you, you know, manage your embedded firmware with a Node.js or Golang written engine on your 32 megabytes of NOR flash, or maybe 128 megabytes of NAND. 
come on, right? Um, we think that a minimal container runtime should be considered baseline infrastructure. It is much closer to the role of the kernel than that to user land applications. Yes, okay, of course, the details, but go back to my conversation about init user namespace. Um, we think that it should fit anywhere. It should be as portable as possible. So, you know, well, why break, why change what isn't broken, right? Um, let's write it in C. After all, you know, LXC is pure C, and this was the true first uh, container runtime, let's call it, not engine, right? So what have we done? This is, the, the, this is where we plug into our story, right? At Pandacore, we have built something called Pandavisor, right? Which is a nimble and lightweight container manager, right? We built it with the needs of embedded in mind, right? At the center, that's all we care about here. Uh, we're talking about a, a container engine, a minimum initial RAM disk that, you know, an over, overhead of no more than one megabyte, let's say, with strict build rules that allow you to configure and change all of those things according to your, uh, the requirements of your device. It is specially suited to small NAND or flash type devices, but of course it can scale all the way up to huge things like a Raspberry Pi, right? Um, it is highly portable. It is built with C using a pluggable runtime architecture. And the main thing we use is actually LXC containers to run each one of the individual payloads. Remember, Pantavisor is in charge of the lifecycle management of, of all of those containers, right? We're not reinventing LXE. We're just providing the right scaffolding around it in this particular case to manage the lifecycle of your embedded devices. And Pantavisor is a single purpose system. It doesn't try to be a full user land or a full OS. It doesn't let you configure your networking or, or figure out all the drivers for your you know, screens or whatever. No, the only purpose is to orchestrate the lifecycle management of your device's user land, which would be in that case that main OS, which is containerized here as well, as well as other application containers, but also your BSP components, your kernel, your firmware, your modules, right? By providing a single way of defining your entire system, then you can modularly manage each component of that system. And it is fast, right? This is just containers. As we said, it's a one megabyte C program, you know, that runs before anything else, and there is no true performance hit, right? But you get all the benefits of modern lifecycle management. Um, so, you know, what, what does Pandavisor let you do, right? It lets you convert, turn your monolithic embedded system into a set of portable and reusable microservices, right? Reuse the code across different projects, make it in a way that those, those dark boxes at the bottom, BSP and hardware, can be interchanged while the things on the top can also be interchanged. Pentavisor is the one that then has the knowledge of who are we running on and how can we bring certain applications to run on top of this BSP, right? Um, this is very powerful because it, it lets your product teams, it lets developers, it lets everyone actually decouple the life cycle of those business logic units that are written for these devices, for these embedded devices, and decouple it from the life cycle of the firmware components, your BSP, your kernel, your modules, your actual static firmware, right? All of this is achieved with something that we call the Pandavisor system format, which is a way that in a single file, every component that is needed to make a, uh, you know, from the kernel up to make a device operate um, is defined and described. In this case, we describe the components that make up a board support package, you know, your kernel, your Pandavisor binary itself, which is your NRD, right? Configuration for those components, as well as every container that is running on top of that. In the very basic use case, you only have one container, which is running one level up from the init user namespace and would actually become your main user land or your main OS container. Now, in parallel to that, you can add other applications, or it could just be a set of functions. You could have a container, which is your networking function, an application that takes care of screens, and an application that takes care of power, right? I understand all of that is relatively high level, right? Just to say it with one slide, um, but it is the type of world that we're trying to define. All of this is, as I said, it's a single project called Pandavisor. It is written in C. It is extremely lean and it has truly been made, well, by embedded engineers for embedded engineers, right? So I invite you guys to, to take a look at what we're doing with this project. Um, you can go to pandavisor.io uh, to learn more about it, to try it on different devices. 
If you have any questions, want to talk to the team, have any suggestions, you want to change anything, or you want to tell us we're completely wrong in our approach, um, or not, please, you can go to community.pantavisor.io and share your thoughts. You know, you'll find that just like you guys, we're embedded developers uh, by trade, and we would like to talk about this with everyone in this community. So thank you guys for, for taking the time to come to, to this chat. Um, I hope some of you will stay afterwards for a, for a bit of Q&A or just a friendly chat um, and see you there. Thank you very much. Um, let's kind of wrap a couple of them up into one question for you. So we had a question about the target, your target memory, which you kind of addressed in, in the slides after the question was asked. So can you talk about target memory and why uh, C is the solution versus Rust or TinyGo, which were, which were also suggested in the, in the comments here? Yes, absolutely. Let me actually mute the other tab. I'm a, okay, there we go. Okay. So first, thanks everyone that is actually joining the, the, the talk and thank you for your engagement. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's two questions in that one, right? One of them is uh, the, the size uh, requirements themselves and the, the target size constraints, let's put it that way, resourcing constraints. And the other one is YC for that type of uh, target size. Right? Um, uh, so first and foremost, when, when we started this project, the main driver was to support containerization on uh, Wi-Fi routers, set-top boxes, and that type of hardware, right? Which five years ago when we started, um, it was very average to find routers in the 16 to 32 megabytes of NOR flash range, right? No flash translation layer, no nothing. Very static monolithic firmware. Um, a lot of us here are used to that. Uh, but those, those vendors we're working with, you know, they wanted to add um, horizontal feature extensibility and they kept getting pitched and this is, you know, my second slide. They they kept getting pitched by big cloud companies or some of you know bigger, higher class, let's say IoT vendors, keep use these high level solutions that just don't fit. And then you know the conversation was always, how do I get through your skull that 32 megabytes is too small? And the other ones would be like, ah, it's fine, you can figure it out because they were salespeople, right? So target original target was 32 16 megabytes of North Flash. In reality, right now we're finding much more. Um, uh, that the market is going at least on the on the Wi-Fi set top boxes and so on, 64 megabytes of NAND flash, 128 megabytes of NAND flash, which is still on the low end, um, because in reality the, the the base firmware, base OS that might be running in there, you know, might take 20, 30, something like that. And there's you know 80, 70 more megabytes to play with to actually deploy dynamic services. Uh, so that that's the baseline target sizes, let's say, right? And from memory point of view, you know, anything over 64 megabytes of RAM. We'll get this working fine. Pentavisor fits in about one megabyte um, of storage uh, footprint. So that, that's the overall target. Now, why C? And this is a question that Sigmund, I think, said many times. <laughs> so Sigmund, you're right. This could be, you know, you, it could be written in Rust, could be written in TinyGo. Um, the choice of C was more because of the market dynamics of the of the deeply embedded ecosystem. And remember, there. Sometimes people sort of put embedded at this, uh, as, as this sort of big umbrella term, but people that are talking about Raspberry Pi class devices up, that's not embedded. That's very big, right? In, at least in my mind, in my world, right? When I'm talking embedded, I'm talking about these things that have no AMMC, no flash translation, single core, 64 megabytes of NAND flash, no more, right? Um, the market dynamics of that lower end are are a lot more complex, like engineers, developers, architects over there are just used to working with C. And this is a reality, right? They're used to working with C, you know, all of their systems work with C. So that's the baseline of the decision. Can there be Rust versions for this? Absolutely, right. Uh, so another question we got was uh, from Tillman. Can you give me an idea about boot and startup times uh, for your system as whole reaching app startup? Yeah, so um, we we utilize several different things that help us reduce whatever impact we might have on the boot time. There is a minimal impact in the order of maybe 15 to 20% more um, of what your normal boot time would be. 
um, I mean, I bet an exact seconds number depends on the board, depends on the system, depends on what we're trying to bring up, right? But on the baseline case of just having your normal, let's say, user land containerized as that sort of host OS container started through Pandavizer, the, the, the time hit might be in the 15% time frame, optimizable with certain things that we can do, right? Um, Fruity Welsh uh, asks, uh, how is administration, what interfaces do you use to deploy new services? Right, right. So so Pandavizer itself, it exposes a, a local API. It exposes a local socket-based API, Unix domain sockets, that, that any container within the running system can leverage to control the life cycle of all the containers and applications that are running on that system. So in reality, anybody can write an agent that controls those APIs, right? Or they could consume directly the systems that 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 we provide for this type of solutions at commercial grade, right? This basically means Pantacore Hub, which is the management cloud for this, which we provide, could be used to, you know, to use that one to one, or you could develop your own. A lot of our customers actually develop their own because they have existing management uh, backplanes, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe you answered this already. I'm not sure. How would this compare to System D uh, and Spawn? Right, so systemd and spawn does not have, does not provide a, a, a big scaffolding for lifecycle management, right? Systemd and spawn does a very similar thing in the sense that it starts up a container, you could say, kind of, right? Um, it's it's up the, 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 the primitives for a container, but the lifecycle management is where it's really important for this type of unattended mission critical devices, right? So what we have combined is that the minimal container runtime and the lifecycle management engine both of those things come together to provide an entire product solution. Right? That's what we try to bring to the market here. Um, so Ruben asked, is there a method to describe which combinations of container versions are compatible, i.e. tested? Um, right, he's so, concerned so, about a risk. Go ahead. So, so this is a story longer than, you know, older than the Bible, let's say, right? <laughs> how, can you, <laughs> how, can you, how can you figure out container de across dependencies, right? The answer is um, there isn't a straightforward way, right? We just provide all of the metadata that is needed for you to understand what container is running at what version. What we have seen is that um, the CI CD pipelines and processes and QA processes of our customers then incorporate that into their decision making engines. What is deployed and stable, release, candidate, canary testing channels, and so on, right? As long as enough metadata is available, then you can keep a very comprehensive view of your deployment and the software that is coming from your pipeline, right? Which is what happens in the cloud, kind of. You know, the cloud is not, this container depends on that other one, right? It's more about the DevOps practices behind it. So we have about 30 seconds left. Um, I think we'll continue the conversation in the room if people want to keep asking questions. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, have you looked at the work done with containers in on uh, Easy, Easy OS and C? So I hadn't looked at ECOS. I just saw it in the question before. It was just trying to search for it, to be fair. So I'll look into it right now. Okay, fair enough.